If you're fully prepared for the Classic Learning Test, or CLT, math section, you should be able to answer this question pretty easily. I'll explain it in just one second. But because you are watching this video, I assume that you are taking the CLT. And as you know, the CLT is an alternative to the SAT or ACT for certain colleges and universities. So this is a critically important exam. So let me uh, go ahead and show you this question. So we have a function f of x is equal to 1 over x uh, times the square root of x minus 2. And what we're trying to determine here is the domain of this function. All right, now, if you think you know the answer, put that into the comments section. I'm going to fully explain the solution to this in just one second. But uh, before we get started, let me tell you who I am. My name is John, and I have been teaching middle and high school math for decades. And I have a very comprehensive CLT math test prep course that will definitely help you get fully prepared for the CLT. You can find a link to that in the description of this video. But uh, let's take a look at the solution to this problem. All right, let's get into uh, the concept of domain. So here is a function, okay? It's the function in question. What is the domain of a function? Well, when we're talking about functions, okay, this is a huge topic in mathematics. Uh, I, you know, there's a whole discussion on what is a function. Functions are certain types of relations. But, um, you know, I don't want to try to cover uh, everything in this video. But basically, a couple basic terms, um, and I'm kind of using that word basically <laughs> probably more than I should because, you know, nothing is basic in terms of mathematics, especially if you don't understand what's going on. But here are some kind of uh, terms when you start learning about functions that you should be familiar with. The first is domain. The second is range. Okay. So what is the domain of a function? Well, the domain of a function is all the allowable input values you can plug into a function. Okay. Now here we are talking about the set of real numbers and what are the real numbers? Well, let's just kind of draw out real quick uh, the real number line. So here's zero in the middle and then we have all these numbers, one, two this way, and negative one, negative two. We have all these positive negative decimals and everything else in between. This entire number line is the real number set, okay? So that's what we're talking about in this particular um, uh, problem. We want to find the allowable numbers on this number line that we can plug into this function. Now, I kind of like uh, to think of the input values or the domain as the, like, the type of fuel you can put into your vehicle, right? So maybe you got a car, you can use unleaded. Maybe you can even get away with um, different types of um, octane. But if you put water into your car or sand into your gas tank, likely it's not going to work too well, right? So you cannot run your car on that type of fuel. It will actually blow up. Well, functions are kind of the same way. So in other words, we just can't throw any input value into some functions, okay? Others, yes, but some have, um, you know, things that you got to look out for. So we're talking about specific type of restrictions, especially when we're talking about the set of real numbers. But let's just do a quick example of evaluating a function just to make this clear. So let's suppose we wanted to find f of 3. Okay, so we're going to plug 3 in to this function as an input value. Let's go ahead and evaluate 3. So what does that mean? We're going to replace these x's here with 3. So f of 3 is going to be 1 over this x will become 3. This x will become 3. So 3 minus 2 is what? That's 1. The square root of 1 is 1. So this is 1 times 3. So this entire thing is 1 third. So in this function, f of 3 is equal to 1 third. So no problem there. We were actually able to plug in a number into our machine here, our engine, and an actual number uh, popped out. 3 is a, a real number, and so is 1 third. So 3 would be part of the domain. Okay, but the domain is the entire set of allowable input values. So let's go ahead and get into the restrictions in terms of the real numbers, things that you are not allowed to kind of put into your, think of it this way. If you have a car, what can't you put in? Well, a whole bunch of stuff, right? Like water you can't put in your gas tank, uh, sand, etc. Same thing with functions. So what are the restrictions? Well, the first is this. You can't put any number into your function such that you'll end up with a zero 
in the denominator. Okay, that's not going to work. Okay, You'll, the, you, anytime you divide by zero, that's undefined. So you just can't do that in mathematics. The second restriction you got to look out for is any number that's going to cause a negative value underneath a square root. Okay, so we plug something in here and we end up with like negative 10, a square root of negative 10. We can't find the answer to this in the set of real numbers. Okay, we can find the answer to this in the set of complex numbers, but we're not uh, trying to find the domain in terms of the set of complex numbers. So we're, uh, we are restricted to the real number set. So these are our two, our two only restrictions. Okay, as long as we stay away from any number that could cause a uh, zero to end up in the denominator or a negative situation underneath a square root, then everything else is fair game. We were allowed to put it into the function. So we have to look at this function and be like, okay, what could cause these scenarios? Okay, um, sometimes no number will cause these scenarios, but sometimes uh, a number will, okay? Now, the first thing you should see is that here we have x right here. So if I try to go f of zero, What's going to happen? Well, I'm going to replace this x with a 0 and this x with a 0. So I'm going to have 0 right here. So 0 times this is definitely going to cause a 0 in the denominator. So 0 is certainly not a number that we can plug into this function. We will have prompts, OK? Um, so 0 is not going to be in the domain. So we got to get it out of the domain. Uh, so that's one restriction. So if you saw that, that's excellent. Okay, so let's kind of go down here and make this a little bit more specific. So here's our function. X cannot be equal to zero. Why? Because it will cause a zero. It, um, this entire denominator will become zero if we try to find F of zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and just say, okay, so far our domain, we have a restriction. X cannot be equal to zero. But that's not the entire story, okay, because here we do have a square root. So we're going to have to make sure that this whole value here cannot end up negative, right? So how do we kind of look at that situation? Well, here's what you want to do. So anytime you have an expression underneath a square root, if something can't be negative, right, if it's not allowed to be negative, well, then what can it be? Well, you can take the square root of zero. That's okay. That's zero, okay? But the square root of zero is not going to work right here because it will give us a zero in the denominator. So the only thing we can have is a square root of positive numbers. So therefore, this expression right here, x minus 2, must be greater than or equal to zero. That's just a fancy way of saying, hey, x minus 2, you must be a positive value, okay? Not greater than or equal to zero, okay? It has to be greater than zero. Now, if this expression here, the square root of x minus 2 was in the numerator, then x minus 2 could be 0 because the square root of, of 0 is 0, and 0 in the numerator is not a problem. So you really got to um, you know, understand all the kind of moving parts here so you can be very accurate in your domain. Okay, so we're going to write down this expression here, x minus 2, you, can, you must be positive, i.e. greater than or equal to 0. So to solve this basic inequality, very simple. It's just like solving an equation. We're just going to add 2 to both sides. So we get the expression or the inequality, excuse me, x is greater than 2. Okay, so these are the x's, okay, that we must have. We have to have x is greater than 2. So because if we had 2 right here, 2 minus 2 is 0. That's going to be a problem. And although x can uh, not be 0, okay, what if x was 1? What if we said, okay, well, um, it's not zero, but what if you try to plug in a one? Well, this would be one right here, but then we would have one minus two, right? Right here, one minus two, which is negative one. Again, we would be trying to take uh, the square root of a negative value, so this cannot work. So x is, all these x's must be greater than two. So a good way to kind of think about this is the following, right? So, so far on this function, we have these restrictions. So uh, x is greater than, x cannot be 0. We talked about that. And x must be greater than 2. But would you uh, describe the domain this way? Mm, not really. What we need to do is the following. Okay, let's put this on a real number line. So here is 0, okay, and here is 2, right? This is all the numbers greater than 2. So if you um, can only put in numbers 
uh, greater than two. So it's, you know, we don't have to concern ourselves with zero because the only numbers we can plug in are greater than two. So that's the only real kind of way um, we need to kind of describe the uh, domain of this function. So let's talk about the notation. So the domain, we can state again, is all numbers x that are greater than two, such that x is an element. This is just fancy uh, notation. Well, I don't want to say so fancy. You should be familiar with this. It's just part of x is a um, part of um, the real number system. Okay, it's a number in a real number system. Now, even if you said x is greater than two, most teachers would be happy to give you a happy face. But uh, to be more technically correct, this is the way you want to do it. And if you want to be extra fancy, you want to use uh, in, uh, interval notation, which would be open uh, parentheses, okay, right here, two. And these numbers are going towards positive infinity, so it's comma, positive infinity. So this is interval notation, which, again, you kind of study generally. Eh, algebra 2 might be seeing some of that, definitely uh, in the at the pre-calculus level. So I hope this video helped you out. And if that's the case, don't forget to like and subscribe. Now remember, there is a lot of math that you need to know to be fully prepared for the CLT. So we're talking about algebra, advanced algebra, geometry, trigonometry, amongst uh, other topics. So you need to study. And I have a 25 chapter test prep course that will help you get really, really prepared for the CLT. Make sure to check that out. Again, you can find a link to it in the description of this video. And with all that being said, I definitely wish you all the best on the CLT. Thank you for your time and have a great day.